to you all today. This meeting is being recorded. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with um, Nikki Geisler for a number of years on some of domestic outreach programming in Montana. Um, I myself actually grew up in Idaho um, and I've been to Montana a couple of times. So very excited to be able to connect with you all, even though it's virtually. Um, would love to do this in person, of course, someday. Um, but uh, <laughs> as mentioned, my name is Irina Carmenova. I work in the Office of Public Liaison at the Department of State. And our mission is to connect um, with the American public. And we do this through a variety of different speakers programs, such as this one, um, where we have conversations around specific foreign policy topics. Uh, we love to engage with high schools, universities, um, world affairs councils. Um, we also work with Rotary Clubs and other organizations like Kiwanis Clubs and diaspora organizations as well. Um, so the sky's the limit. We just, uh, we love having these conversations about what it is that we do and, and why diplomacy matters um, and how our diplomats operate overseas and what impact that creates uh, back home in our home states. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna play a short one minute long video before handing it over to my colleague who will talk about um, the role of his office and the role of his uh, in Women's History Month, kind of talking a little bit about women's empowerment around the world and what his office does to support that. So let me play this quick video in the meantime. It's a wonderful and complex world out there, filled with challenges and opportunities. That's why America's diplomats with the U.S. Department of State are on the job every day representing you. We are advancing America's foreign policy interests by uniting our allies, confronting our adversaries, in protecting our citizens. We advance democracy, human rights, global health, and more. We grow markets that create American jobs. We are America's first federal agency, and we're in 190 countries at over 270 U.S. embassies and consulates serving you. We are the United States Department of State. Thank you so much for watching that. And I'll hand it over to my colleague, Mark. All right, thank you, Rena. Um, and um, I also would like to say that I'm from the great Northwest. I um, was born in the state of Louisiana, but spent most of my life in Washington state uh, and have family in Idaho. And that's kind of now my hometown when I go back to visit uh, family is in Boise. Um, never been to Montana, but I will certainly have opportunities in the future. Uh, now that I'm living in the US uh, after being overseas for almost 16 years. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you um, and uh, thank uh, all of you for uh, attending today. Thanks to the World Affairs Council of Montana, to also to ARENA and the Bureau of Global uh, Public Affairs uh, for all the support in making this event possible. So again, I'm the Senior Advisor, Director of Operations for the Secretary's Office of Global Women's issues, uh, which we refer to uh, as SGWE. And um, I'm a Foreign Service Officer, joined the department in 2003. Uh, my cone or area of specialty is public diplomacy. And when we're overseas, that often translates to two hats that we wear. One is that cultural and educational hat, uh, putting together programming, which includes exchanges, uh, visitors from the US, uh, and all sorts of ways that we can showcase American culture with the idea that when you uh, foreign audiences understand Americans better, they're more likely to be receptive to our policies. Uh, and then, of course, the communication side, media, press, 
social media, digital platforms, uh, combating disinformation seems to be a growing uh, need and topic uh, for us in the department and for our diplomacy overseas. So that's my background. I was overseas, as I said, for almost 17 years, came back, uh, spent a year at the National Defense University, and now I am with SGWE. I have to say the, the jobs that were mentioned earlier, um, every time I get a new assignment, I think this is the best job. Um, but now it's really true. Um, and I hope that after our session today that uh, I'll be able to leave with you a glimpse of what we're doing in SGWE and the impact that we're having on, uh, at home and abroad. So our mission in SGWE is to lead the State Department's efforts to promote the rights and empowerment of women and girls in all their diversity through US diplomacy, partnerships, and programs. Um, so I'll discuss gender equality as a longstanding cornerstone of US foreign policy and also the role of my office in advancing that important issue. So let me start by defining a few key terms. Um, first one, gender equality, which is the state or condition that affords men and women of all gender identities, equal em enjoyment of human rights and freedoms, socially valued goods, opportunities and resources, and overall quality of life. Our work is deeply motivated by a commitment to women and girls, recognizing the longstanding systemic discrimination and barriers which continue to affect their safety and full participation in society. Now, gender equity is the means to achieve gender equality. An equitable approach works to correct historical and social disadvantages that have left women and girls behind in some areas to enable a fair and equal starting point. Examples of gender equity efforts include addressing social norms that restrict women's employment or providing the tools that women need to succeed economically, such as access to education, health, uh, healthcare, cash transfers, uh, et cetera. Gender. When we talk about gender, we're referring to the socially constructed set of roles, rights, responsibilities, entitlements, and behaviors associated with masculinity or femininity in different contexts. These social definitions and negative consequences for not adhering to them vary among cultures, change over time, and often intersect with other factors such as age or class. This is where a gender analysis, a social, social science tool used to identify the relevance of gender norms and power relations on individuals' behaviors and that person's access to and control over resources, opportunities, services, uh, services and decision-making. The analysis or gender analysis provides the data corresponding insights and thereby, thereby identifies potential differential impacts of policies and programs on men and women and results in recommendations to enable efforts to avoid unintended con consequences and improve outcomes in gender equality. Um, I was at National Ten Defense University. My focus was on cyberspace and emerging technologies uh, and we used to say it's all about the data, but data-driven decisions based on gender analysis help us make better policies, develop programs, uh, deliver on our outreach in a much better way. But key to all of these efforts to empower women and girls is intersectionality. Intersectionality is an analytical framework for understanding how different aspects of a person's identities create systems of discriminations and privilege. An intersectional approach focuses on 
understanding and addressing the unique needs of and often higher risks of violence and marginalization, marginalization faced by women and girls who have a disability or are displaced, LGBTQI plus persons, or part of a racial, ethnic, or religious minority group, among other identities. It's that cross intersectional approach that really addresses women and gender in all their diversity. So with all that terminology in mind, I'd like to discuss three topics today. Uh, gender equality as a Biden-Harris administration priority, SGWE's role in advancing women and girls' rights and empowerment, and then some examples of current US foreign policy efforts to address global challenges. So gender equality as an administration priority. President Biden made uh, gender equity and equality a cornerstone of this administration's policy priorities from the start of taking office. One year ago in a couple of days, Executive Order 14020 established the White House Gender Policy Council. This is like a new agency to advance gender equity and equality in both domestic and foreign policy development and implementation. While previous administrations have had offices focused on women and girls, including the White House Council on Women and Girls under President Obama and the Office of Women's Initiatives and Outreach under President Clinton, the Gender Policy Council is the first freestanding policy council focused on gender equity and equality within the executive office of the president. Last October, following on the establishment of the Gender Policy Council, the Biden-Harris administration issued the first ever national strategy on gender equity and equality. We call it the NGS or Nas National Gender Strategy affirming the U.S. commitment to advancing the rights and empowerment of women and girls at home and abroad as both a moral and strategic imperative. The National Gender Strategy, or NGS, builds on and complements the administration's broader equity agenda, agenda, including on racial equity, the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons, international religious freedom, and the rights of persons with disabilities. It serves as an overarching umbrella framework to tie together related efforts to advance the rights of empowerment of women and girls, such as the Women, Peace and Security or WPS agenda, addre addressing gender-based violence and promoting women's economic empowerment and security. SGWE is currently leading the department's efforts, the State Department, to develop an action plan to advance the NGS or National Gender Strategy through innovative and transformative gender equality diplomatic and foreign assistance deliverables and implements institutional reforms necessary to achieve effective and sustainable gender integration across US foreign policy assistance. So let me just explain uh, a little bit of what that means. Gender integration. What we're trying to do is institutionalize gender, women and gender policies. And what we do is we identify gender POCs in each of our regional functional bureaus at our embassies and consulates uh, who then can be trained to become subject matter experts on women and gender issues, and then more effectively uh, deliver on our policy agenda of promoting the rights and empowerment of women and girls. Uh, so institutionalizing um, the, the, through an action plan and establishing a network of POCs. My, my office is working closely with the Gender Policy Council the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, the interagency to up also update the 2016 U.S. strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally. 
And we are working to develop a new woman's economic security strategy. So underneath the national gender strategy, we have these three sub strategies, women's economic empowerment, women, peace and security, and combating uh, gender-based violence. Um, and those three uh, sub strategies make up the pillars of the policy pillars within our office. SG, we also continue to part with, partner with USAID and the Departments of Defense and Homeland Security to implement women, peace and security strategy and a corresponding implementation plan in line with the WP Act, uh, WPS Act of 2017 and the corresponding WPS strategy and implementation plans. We take a consultative approach to developing US strategies and plans related to gender equality, which means meaningful engagement with civil society, with Congress, with affected populations. And this helps inform our foreign policy, our foreign assistance, and our public diplomacy. So now, second uh, topic, SGWE's role, our mandate, and our operations. I'll provide an overview of all of this and what we're doing in SGWE. Our office was established to promote the human rights and full participation of women and girls in all aspects of society. Recognizing that gender equality is not only a human rights issue, our mandate is a critical foundation on all US foreign policy efforts, including to promote free and fair democracies, inclusive economic growth, preventing and resolving conflicts and promoting security and stability, preventing and responding to gender-based violence, and more effectively address global challenges such as the climate crisis, widespread forced displacement, like what we're seeing with Ukraine, and the COVID-19 pandemic and resulting economic and social impacts. Our office is headed by an ambassador at large that reports directly to the Secretary of State and coordinates the department's efforts to advance the rights and empowerment of women and girls in US policy, diplomacy, partnerships, and programs. Our organization's structure includes four primary components, policy, global programs, regional affairs, and our newest, the policy planning and public diplomacy team. Under policy, we have three teams that focus on our primary pillars, which I already mentioned. One dedicated to women's economic empowerment, another to women, peace and security, and a third to prevention and response to gender-based violence and other cross-cutting issues, including climate action. SGWE builds the department's institutional and personnel capacity to integrate and advance gender equality in their work by providing targeted training and tools, guidance on gender analysis, and inst uh, integration into our institutional practices, which I had mentioned. This includes in strategic planning and budgeting, policy and program development, measurement and data, management and training. We also directly support the efforts of our embassies and consulates around the world to promote gender equality on the ground overseas. Our office also advances gender equality through multilateral, bilateral, and public diplomacy efforts, such as through the UN Commission on the Status of Women. I spoke this morning to the G7 uh, about uh, our efforts also on the commission of uh, on the status of women um, and also what the OECD had produced in a report to highlight what the G7 is doing well and what it can improve on. And so we're advocating through those multilateral um, mechanisms uh, to improve the status of women. There are also regional efforts like U the US 
India Alliance for Women's Economic Empowerment. Uh, we also oversee the annual Secretary of State's International Woman of Cour Courage Award and Ceremony, which by the way is happening this coming Monday. So if you're interested, please tune in on state.gov and you will be able to see that uh, event live. Our ceremony uh, will uh, include 12 courageous women from six different regions around the world. Um, I am proud to say that the only Brazilian woman to ever receive that award was my nominee when I was back in Rio and she was leading the pacification program in Rio in advance of uh, the Olympic games and uh, the World Cup at that time, uh, their security efforts. Um, we have a focused portfolio of innovative programs, which is supported uh, in part by the newly established Gender Equity and Equality Action or GIA fund. This fund dedicates 100 million in fiscal year 2021 for the Department of State and USAID to advance economic security for women and girls globally, including from marginalized and underserved populations. And just a couple of days ago on International Women's Day, President Biden announced the fiscal year 2023 budget proposal will include a requested 2.6 billion for foreign assistance programs that promote gender equality worldwide, more than doubling the amount requested for gender programs last year. This includes a request for 200 million for the Gender Equity and Equality Fund, which again, we, we and primarily uh, USAID are leading uh, the implementation of that fund. Last year, our programs trained and supported 25 human rights organizations, 50 civil society organizations were engaged in advocacy on gender equity and equality. More than 250 women from around the world participated in substantive role or uh, positions in a peace building process supported with our assistance. And our programs helped implement more than 60 activities uh, other activities and programs to strengthen civic participation of women. More than 21,500 people, 98% women, participated in programs that we led uh, designed to increase uh, uh, access to productive economic resources. Uh, through our targeted efforts to prevent and respond to gender-based violence, our programs reached more than 10,800 people through interventions providing GBV services. I'd also like to highlight that when I was in Lisbon, uh, I helped start a women's economic empowerment program uh, there. It was women's entrepreneurship. And during three years, we onboarded over 900 women to what we had started was corporate mentoring, pairing US and also European corporations with women entrepreneurs. And it was so successful. We had 34 the first year corporations who signed on to do it, to do this. Some of them who took a couple of women entrepreneurs uh, as mentees. Um, we then also started a uh, student uh, consulting program with six universities in Portugal, also assisting women entrepreneurs to develop either marketing plans or a business plan or with their finances, uh, a very successful program. Just an example of the type of programs we do overseas. Third topic, I'd like to provide some concrete examples of our work um, in relation to a few current challenges. Addressing the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on women and girls is a top priority for this administration and for SGWE. Promoting women and girls' roles in responding to climate change is another area that we're focused on. For example, 
SG, we launched the Innovation Station initiative in July of last year to amplify women and girls developing innovative solutions to climate related challenges and then help these women and girls connect with new domestic and international communities that could benefit from their work. Over the past year, our initiative convened five virtual events. Uh, we just had a sixth today. <laughs> these events have spotlighted uh, over uh, 35 women innovators who have developed over 130 new collaborative relationships including more than 30 with US missions abroad as a result of their participation in this initiative. Since its launch, the Innovation Station has expanded to include a weekly podcast and a quarterly newsletter with more virtual events planned for the months to come. With regards to crisis situations, our office continues to advocate for the rights of Afghan women and girls including advanced foreign assistance, relocation efforts for at-risk at women leaders and women's rights advocates, and amplifying the voices of Afghan women political and civil society leaders. Our office was proud to add the secretary's appointment of Rina Amiri as the first ever special envoy for Afghan women, girls, and human rights and also the Senior Advisor for Women and Girls for the Coordinator for Afghan Relocation Efforts, or CARE, as we call it, um, and her name is Stephanie Foster. Together, we're working to continue to consistently elevate these issues for Afghan women and girls throughout the U.S. government and with Afghan women leaders and civil society. We are now also actively monitoring the crisis in Ukraine and providing support to our implementing partners there in Ukraine and to women leaders in the region. As you have probably seen and heard, many of those that are fleeing Ukraine are women and children. Their flight to Poland and other neighboring countries creates additional challenges for the Ukrainians and also for the countries who are receiving them. Congress is working on passing the FY uh, fiscal year 2022 budget for this fiscal year, an omnibus bill that will include significant funding for humanitarian assistance for Ukraine that will be administered in large part by the State Department. And our office is already involved in interagency discussions on how best to assist women and girls through this crisis and this will include in shaping ongoing and future humanitarian assistance. Now, an invitation. I'd like to invite all of you to follow our social media on Facebook and Twitter. You can find us on state.gov by searching Global Women's Issues, where you'll also find many resources. And now is an exciting time to be working on women's issues and on all diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility policies and issues. Our office and the State Department is always looking for talent and diversity to join our ranks. The department welcomes interns in person and virtually. Programs like Pathways, the Presidential Management Fellows, Jefferson Science Fellows, the AAAS Fellowship, and other programs are a great way to get experience in and even join the State Department. And of course, Foreign Service is how I joined the State Department and is a great career which I invite you all to consider. Please search careers.state.gov for more info on how you can become involved with our efforts in assisting women and girls. In closing, I'd like to say that we're the United States is proud to be a global leader on efforts to promote women and girls empowerment. Our office, SGWE, is proud to support the Biden-Harris administration's prioritization of women and gender, equity and equality. And Secretary of State Blinken continues to reaffirm his commitment to advancing this issue through US foreign policy 
recognizing that countries with higher levels of gender equality are also more stable and secure. Thanks for, the, again, the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to taking your questions. Mark, thank you so much for that incredible presentation. We have been so fortunate to have so many amazing friends, colleagues, and partners from the U.S. Department of State come on and talk to our Montana students about a whole range of issues, and this one is really front and center these days. So thank you so much for rounding that out. Now, uh, like usual, I'm going to invite our classrooms across Montana to ask Mark some questions. Now, Mark, if, if you'll allow us, um, we typically have a range of questions, some on your presentation, but maybe some more broadly about what does it mean and what is it like to be a foreign service officer for the United States? So uh, you may be fielding a few of those as well. Um, so uh, I, I'll, I'm just gonna invite our classrooms to just jump on. You can unmute and ask Mark directly um, via the, the link, or you can chat in a question and I'll try to curate those. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna stand by here and wait for any question. I don't, I don't see a hand up. So Mark, maybe while, while the students are organizing their questions, if you'd allow me to kick one off. Um, I'm really fascinated um, by the work here and, and obviously by the importance and the priority that the US government puts in women and girls and gender issues across the world. I wonder if you might share from some of your experience that when the United States supports this idea and programs in different countries, what kinds of impact and what kinds of changes do you see in places where the United States works on these issues? Yeah, thank you. Um, so as I said, I have worked overseas quite a bit and a lot of my work has been um, supporting this longstanding policy, uh, women's empowerment uh, and uh, combating gender-based violence have been longstanding issues. Women's peace and security rose to the top as a UN um, uh, resolution in which we are actively implementing and encouraging other countries to implement as well. I'll give you just a couple of examples. I already mentioned the one about women's economic empowerment and the entrepreneurship, women's entrepreneurship program in Portugal. So small country uh, compared to many others, uh, about um, 11 million. When I was there, Portugal was experiencing an economic hardship. They were uh, working within the European Union on austerity measures. So in other words, uh, conservative fiscal measures to ensure um, uh, prudent uh, government spending uh, meeting their obligations with the EU, which put a lot of stress on the economy, was politically polemic. Um, and uh, you might be surprised that Portugal has, uh, in many ways, a very advanced society, but in some ways, uh, very backwards when it comes to supporting women's equality. And that translated there uh, in uh, what is often, uh, uh, which is now also one of our top priorities, the care economy. When there is economic downturns, it's often the woman who becomes the care provider. And then that woman loses her economic um, contribution to the household, as well as independence. Uh, and it becomes very challenging for many households uh, because of that. Well, with this economic downturn, there were also a lot of situations where the, the men breadwinner in Portugal lost their jobs and the women who had innovative ideas for either products or services thought, well, I better do something and took their ideas to the market. Well, they may have had some great ideas on, again, a product or service, but had no familiarity with how 
to run a business. Um, so we provided the training through corporate mentorship, through the, the student consultings, through lots of workshops and seminars to a, a growing network of women who gained not only the business skills, they became contributors to Portugal's economy. And the three years that I was there in which we were implementing this program, uh, we saw a rise of interest by not only universities and businesses, but also by the government to assist in new startups. So startups became the hot buzzword in Portugal. And much of that work was assisting, again, women startups for their uh, new businesses, which, as I said, had an effect of uh, improving Portugal's economy. What I think it also did is it provided confidence for many of these women who, when they were first starting, felt like this is uh, a daunting uh, endeavor to start a new business, lots of financial risk, responsibility, um, but then they became confident and uh, also contributed back to assisting other women. And after a couple of years, this network grew and grew. And you may have heard of the word angel investors, but investors seeking to assist new startups uh, investing in their uh, businesses with the hopes that this business will be successful and that investment having a return. So then we became a source for angel investors and other sources of income to come to our network looking for opportunities to invest in new businesses. So it's that kind of um, effect that you can have starting an initial program that leads to increased income, increased confidence, and also increased economic opportunity uh, for all of those in that network. Uh, so that's just one example. Outstanding. I mean, talk about a virtuous cycle, Mark. Thanks a lot for that. Now, um, not surprisingly, our high school classrooms down in the Bitterroot Valley in Hamilton and Stevensville have great questions. There's a lot of them. So I'd ask you to, you know, we have maybe 20 minutes. So measure your responses accordingly, Mark, to, to, as much as you can. The first one is very timely given the situation in the Ukraine. We've been covering a lot of conflict here. Um, so let's ask from Hamilton, how is SG we helping prevent violence against women and girls in dangerous areas such as Syria, Yemen, Nigeria, and I'm gonna add Ukraine and other areas. Yeah, um, we have um, a bureau in the State Department called uh, Conflict and Stabilization. And their focus is on uh, addressing conflict areas. And there are all sorts of things that happen when there's conflict. There's, of course, the actual a conflict, let's use uh, the Ukraine example, Russia invading Ukraine, uh, bombing, um, having um, consequences of killing uh, women and girls who are not involved in the conflict but become victims to the conflict. There's also the displacement of people who uh, are fleeing from the conflict to neighboring countries. And then when people are displaced, they often group together. The countries figure out how to assist them in an organized way, but it's often a, a too little, too late to help many of these uh, displaced persons. Uh, and then, unfortunately, women and girls, um, when there is um, a group of our displaced people, often become victims of sexual violence. And so what we do in the department is first of all, recognize and help others, um, allies and maybe those who are uh, not our all allies, raising the issues of these, uh, um, these consequences of the conflict uh, and in our, our case, particularly on women and girls. 
Uh, we also, in the case of Afghanistan, as you probably saw, there was a, a, a large effort to assist not only Americans and uh, green card holders, but also partners with whom we have worked over 20 years. Uh, we've worked with civil society and with women leaders who became uh, very vulnerable during the fall of Afghanistan to uh, the Taliban and their attempts to flee the country. Well, where do they go? So what we did in that case is we spoke to many of the neighboring countries and asked, could they receive these women um, and children and other advocates for women's rights? Uh, could they receive them temporarily while we, the United States, work to transport them in a, an informed way to the US and begin a refugee process for them upon arrival. That uh, took some time. Uh, many countries were afraid of saying, yes, we'll take them and opening their doors and not being able to uh, slow the, the fast flow of people desperately trying to find safety. So it's a, it was a diplomatic effort with neighboring countries. It was pointing out the atrocities that occur during conflict. It was directly helping women and girls who emailed or contacted our office asking for assistance, giving them information of how to get into the refugee or humanitarian parole process. Um, a lot of efforts. Uh, it took many of our staff away from their day jobs, and they were working seven days a week, day and night, to assist Afghan women. It was very emotional for many of our team members who were directly involved, uh, but that's what was called for um, in that time. And now, uh, yes, Ukraine. And so we are also working uh, within our interagency, within the department. Uh, as I mentioned, there's humanitarian aid that we're trying to define how and who could help implement that aid. Um, so a lot of work on several fronts. Mark, thanks a lot for that. I, I'm going to pick up here on a Stevensville question, but maybe I'll just have a slight um, edit given uh, what you just spoke on on Afghanistan. Um, they're asking uh, to, to go in a little more depth in Afghanistan. Let me kind of just reframe that. Um, could you give us a little insight, um, not necessarily, you, you spoke um, about the, the evacuation period. Part one question, are you or any of your partners able to work in, Af in Afghanistan now? And if so, what do you do? And part two of the question is, before August, what were you doing in Afghanistan? Okay, so uh, I can tell you I personally worked in Afghanistan. Uh, I was the public diplomacy field director, which I, again, I thought was the best job uh, in the department. At the time, I was responsible for our public diplomacy outside of Kabul, so everything outside of the capital, um, which allowed me to travel around the country while we were drawing down our military presence. And so what I was trying to do at that time was establish partnerships with universities, with media outlets, with uh, government, uh, the pro provincial governor's offices that had media personnel and um, needed training and equipment. We also established what we called Lincoln Learning Centers, which are American spaces. So you can think of them as almost um, mini libraries that provide access to Americana to learn more about the US, uh, but also access to internet, to programming and such. So what, what I was trying to do was set up um, partnerships so that we can remain engaged with the local communities through those partnerships. That's kind of a very specific example. But at the time, there was a heavy presence by the US 
uh, in assistance uh, and development. USAID was very uh, present there, um, among other uh, avenues for foreign assistance. And the, the challenge in a place like that is you can't have development without security, but you can't have security if you're not developing. So it's trying to identify where uh, it made sense to invest in both, right? Which areas of the country could we ensure that we would maintain a security presence even after our departure from some of those areas, working with the Afghan government, ensuring that their security forces were trained and were able to secure a certain area, then we would retain or even develop foreign assistance programs uh, in those areas to engage with civil society, with education, with uh, women and girls, uh, uh, youth, um, media, um, democratic institutions, if you could think of it that way, uh, to try to strengthen democracy in that country. Of course, now things have changed there uh, and we are assessing where we will, we will maintain much of our foreign assistance and development programs and where there is simply not enough security or oversight to ensure that the taxpayer's money and our work there is being done in an effective way. Your question about um, Americans, well, US government personnel are no longer present there. Um, that doesn't mean we can't travel there. So I mentioned our uh, special envoy on Afghan uh, women, girls, and human rights. She has gone to the region and has met with the Taliban, with uh, local partners. Um, she has not gone into Afghanistan, but she's engaging on Afghanistan in the region. And much of what she's trying to do is in establish local partnerships in the region to continue, continue to assist Afghan women and girls. Um, I hope that kind of yeah. answered your question. Absolutely, absolutely. Here, here's another very interesting one from Hamilton High School. This is more in the general foreign service category, but of course, every four or eight years, we have a new administration. Um, and the Department of State, of course, um, it has different dynamics. And so the question is, how does your job, or maybe let's say the job of a foreign service officer change as presidential administrations change? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we get that question a lot, especially when we're overseas and the administration changes. We're often asked by local uh, publics, so what changes now with your job? Um, first of all, as a foreign service officer, I'm in it as, uh, that's my career. So I'm not subject to political changes. My job is a permanent career job and I stay on with my job. The ambassador, however, is appointed by the president. So when we have a new administration with a change of president, the ambassadors, and in particular, the political ambassadors, offer their uh, letter of resignation, and it's up to the new administration to decide, yes, leave now, um, and also who will be nominated to replace that ambassador. And when an ambassador from a prior administration leaves, uh, and before, and a new ambassador has been uh, nominated and confirmed by the Senate and then takes that role, we have what's called the charge d'affaires, where essentially a, an acting ambassador, if you will, who is often this number two at the time, but when the ambassador leaves, that person becomes the lead for our diplomatic mission at post. So that's a very important change. And then, of course, you would need to... Uh, recognize that different administrations bring different policy priorities. So our policies um, and what rises to the top, shall we say, 
of those um, administration priorities can change. And so we as diplomats, career foreign service officers work to understand what the new policy priorities are and then help uh, foreign audiences by articulating those new policies and engaging, explaining, and uh, promoting those policies. We're often asked, well, what if you don't agree with um, the, the new administration's policies? You know what? That was a question I, I started a little later in life in my foreign service career. And I had enough experience to know that, you know what? I don't always agree with my boss anyway. That's going to happen with government too. You're not always going to agree with everything your government or even your boss tells you to do. But when we are uh, sworn in to our jobs as foreign service officers, we swear an oath to the constitution, not to the president, not to the administration's policies, but to the constitution. And that is what drives our commitment. Our commitment is to the people of the United States to our work as foreign diplomats and to supporting uh, our administration, whichever it might be at the time. Thanks a lot for that, Mark. Now I see Mr. Aits's class in Gallatin High School has joined us. Um, Mr. Aits, um, if you have a question, we can squeeze one more in before our friends at the Department of State have to go. Do you want to um, come off your microphone or chat in a question, Gallatin High School? Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, let's go to the question. We had another interesting one here from Stevensville. Uh, it, it, I think this is both a general question and has to do with your, your gender work. Does a wage gap exist between men and women within government organizations to a large extent? Um, yes and no. Let me explain that. Um, so the uh, positions have with the, with the US government, uh, if you're civil service, it's a GS schedule of, uh, based on um, what your grade and step will be. Same kind of concept with the foreign service. Uh, so for the State Department, your salary depends not on your position uh, so much as your grade and step. That said, uh, we've done uh, some data analysis, including gender analysis, which I had mentioned earlier. Uh, and we do see that uh, some of our bureaus do better than others. So them, uh, for just as a random example, our regional uh, offices may have a greater number of women and women in higher positions or higher grades um, and then a corresponding higher level of pay in those bureaus. Other bureaus may do less well, um, but I think it's still the case that there are inequities in especially the higher level positions uh, for women to reach those positions. Um, and then also um, racial inequities and other inequities. So, and as I said, the intersectionality of equities is important. You never want to just point to women and girls and focus on that without being aware of the other equities involved as well, because um, that can tell you uh, a broader story of where there are inequities. So yes, we still have a lot of work to do to achieve equality in uh, the State Department and in other of our US government agencies as well. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, in the last two minutes, I'm going to be signing off here. Let me start by thanking you, Mark, for bringing a slice of your world to our students here in Montana. And just to remind our Montana students, not that you need it, that 
There are a lot of men and women from America serving overseas, many of them in uniform, many of them not in uniform, and those uh, can be from the U.S. Department of State doing our diplomacy. Uh, and so we appreciate you and your work and spending some time with us. I also thank all of the classrooms out there for your interest in staying engaged in the world. Hey, teachers, if you like this kind of thing, let us know. We've got great ties with the State Department and other organizations. If you want to know something, let us know. This is what we do day in and day out. So thanks a lot for that. Also, thanks to our very generous sponsors who bring this and more counsel in the classroom across Montana. Uh, Arena, Mark, thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming on today. And thanks to all of the high schools across Montana. Everybody, take care. Be well. See you soon. Bye-bye.